Hello and welcome to everybody joining us for this second session of the day. Um, I still have my nerves and I don't know why, but I'm hoping that by the end of tomorrow they'll have gone or the adrenaline will have gone. I'll just be basically asleep on stage. But anyway, um, I'm really excited to uh, introduce this panel. First of all, I need to do the housekeeping again, though. So if you have questions and you're in the audience here, please put your hand up towards the end of the, um, the session and there will be a, a Q&A at the end. If you're watching online at home, you can use the Q&A box there as well and we'll put your questions to the panellists. There's live speech to text captioning and there's also BSL. Um, if you're interested in buying any of the books um, by any of our speakers after the event, you can do so outside. Blackwell's has the stall and there'll be a signing. Or if you're watching online, you can order using the link that's online as well. I think that's it for the housekeeping. So I'm really pleased to introduce this panel on plague nurses and lady doctors. Um, it's chaired by um, somebody that I've been trying to get to come to his fest for quite some time, Angela Saini, who's a journalist and author based in New York. She teaches science writing at MIT, and her work appears regularly in National Geographic, Science and Foreign Policy. Her 2019 book, Superior, The Return of Race Science, was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize, and her latest, The Patriarchs, which is on sale outside, um, How Men Came to Rule, was a finalist for the Orwell Prize for political writing. She has a master's in engineering from the University of Oxford. I'm going to hand over to Angela. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here, and especially talking about this topic. I was just saying to Kavita and Lara before we came that one of the reasons that um, I never took up medicine when I was younger is because I have this pathological fear of blood. I pass out sometimes when we're talking about blood, so I very much hope there isn't going to be any mention of that today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> I might be asking for too much. Um, so today, more than three quarters of NHS staff are women. I'm sure you're aware if you've ever been to the hospital. And nearly half of all doctors, and that's true in many parts of the world. Women dominate healthcare. They are the dominant group within healthcare professionals uh, globally. It wasn't always this way. And our speakers today have been filling in some of those fascinating histories that take us to where we are now. So there obviously have been women working in medicine or medical allied, allied fields for a very long time. But we never really hear about those stories very much, so I hope we get to do that. Kavita Rao is a freelance journalist and writer. She has taught journalism at several colleges, including the Indian Institute of Journalism and New Media in Bangalore and uh, Sophia College in Mumbai. Her work has been published in The Guardian, The New York Times, The South China Morning Post, and several other places. Her book is Lady Doctors, um, about India's pioneering women doctors, and it just came out very recently in the UK. Dr. Lara Thorpe has been researching London's Great Plague of 1665 for the past decade. In 2018, she completed her PhD thesis, imagining and examining the physicians, nurses, alchemists, and quacks who offered care during the pandemic and the pills and potions they prescribed to combat it. So she's here to talk about um, a chapter she contributed to an academic text known as Women on the Edge in Early Modern Europe, which looks at plague nurses. Um, and they're both incredibly fascinating women. Their work is so great. Um, but just before, because this is my privilege as a chair, I just want to mention that part of the reason I found their work so gripping was that there is a woman in my own extended family, um, my husband's late great aunt, Vimla Sood, and in fact her, uh, her relatives are here in the audience today. Um, she was born in 1922 and she was India's first female dentist. She died uh, a few years ago, but I was very lucky to meet her before, before that. And she was a remarkable woman. She traveled the world, she trained, and she traveled by ship. She was born in 1922. Um, and she lived life entirely on her own terms. And I think Kavita, for me, that struck me uh, about the stories in your book is that these are women really bucking convention, doing things in completely different ways, and often butting against um, tradition and ritual and religion and ideas about what is appropriate for women. What made you want to explore these stories? 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer this question briefly <laughs> because there were so many things that made me write this book. Uh, you know, what initially prompted me was going on Google one day, and I'm not a historian, I'm a journalist. I went on Google one day and I saw this picture of one of the women in the book. And I was like in the Google Doodle. And I was like, why do I not know about this woman? Why do more Indians not know about this woman? Why do we not have her in our museums? Why is she not in our textbooks? And I dug a little deeper and I realized that we do not know about her. Most Indians do not know about these women because all the material about these women is in Western libraries, mostly in the British library, <laughs> where we are sitting right now. Okay, It's not in Indian libraries because we are not an archival culture. And again, because women of that time did not write memoirs, their letters were not preserved, they, you know, nobody had the, uh, you know, the time or the inclination to uh, keep records of them. So that's one reason. Another reason is actually Angela's own book, her first book maybe, Inferior, which really sort of you know, gave me something to think about because the book is about how women have been kept out of science. And if you're from India and you're talking about women scientists, people will immediately go, oh yes, Marie Curie, and then they will come to this sort of shuddering stop because they cannot think of any other scientists. <laughs> And I've even had a lot of young men say to me, well, you see, that's because women aren't very good at sciencing. <laughs> and when I dug a little further, I found that women, both British, American, Indian, all of them, were very good at sciencing. It's just that they were not allowed into colleges. Their gold medals were taken away from them. They were not allowed to study. And when they were, they got very good at sciencing. So that's why I really wanted to tell these stories. And as she said, medicine is one of those very respectable professions for Indian women. It's like, you know, uh, you know, at the top of the pile, sort of, you know, so to speak. So I wanted to see how women went from being called whores, which they were in the 1860s, to being respected, you know. I do love the verb sciencing. I'm going to be using that now. And we're doing science with sciencing. Um, and how receptive were publishers to this book? Because I know when I wrote Inferior, there, were, there was a little bit of resistance to this idea that this even needed to be written. It was just, I don't know. I think publishers were quite scared. How was it for you? So in India, it was very, they were very receptive because they had never you know, sort of read about these women. It was completely unknown. In the UK, I had immense trouble getting published. Uh, this finally came out uh, last September. Uh, in the UK, and it's come out with an indie publisher, Jacaranda. I'm very grateful to them for taking a risk on me, because every other mainstream publisher said, well, why would British people want to read the stories of Indian women? And to me, there's a very simple answer. The story of science is more or less the same the world over. Yes, Indian women had more challenges, but it's very similar the world over, you know, how women were kept out of science. This is why I think British people should read about them. And also many of the lady doctors came to the UK to study. They studied in the London School of Medicine, which is now part of UCL. And they were in contact with British mentors. There's a lot of that going on. So mm -hmm. it was very hard to get it published in the UK, but eventually it did. Yeah. yeah, and I really do recommend it. It's such a fascinating book. And not least because I think we often imagine the experience of women scientists to be quite similar all over the world. And it's a really important reminder that that's not true. There are other axes of oppression and difference that play out in these women's lives, especially caste in this one. So the caste system, of course, is still, it still holds India in such a tight grip. And it does mean that today in modern day academia and in the professions and in politics for that matter, uh, they are dominated by the higher caste, including higher caste women. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about the caste angle in the story? Yes, so this book covers the 1860s to the 1930s. Obviously caste played a huge part back then and it still plays a huge part in India right now. Uh, so most of the women in this book are upper, were upper caste which is why they were able to access education. 
But uh, one was a lower caste woman. Uh, she's my favorite. Uh, I've titled the chapter on her The Rule Breaker. Uh, because she, her name was Rukma Bai, and she broke all the rules for a Hindu woman at that time. Uh, she divorced her husband. She went to court to divorce her husband, which was not allowed back in the 1880s. She was, you know, uh, she was a lower caste woman. Uh, okay, she was attacked by all of the Hindu conservatives and the orthodoxy. Uh, she managed to come all the way to London to study in the 1880s and studied at the London School of Medicine. She then returned to India and lived as a single woman and practiced medicine for 35 years, very quietly. So she broke all the rules and she got so much, uh, you know, criticism, savage criticism and, you know, she was, her character was attacked. And I think that was mostly because she was a lower caste woman and she was breaking the rules for Hindu women. In fact, you know, the main, uh, you know, criticism of her was, well, if she does, you know, does that, you know, divorces her husband, runs off to study, well, all our wives will do that, won't they? And we can't have that. So uh, that was one of the main criticisms of her. Whereas the others, because they were upper caste, they were protected from this criticism. So that's how caste played a very important role. Mm. And Lara, there are so many parallels between your work and Covetous, even though they can cover completely different centuries, and we will come to that. But first of all, can you just paint a picture for us of what medicine was like in the 17th century when the plague happened, because it is far less formal than it, than it is now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the world of medicine of the 17th century was, I think, fundamentally different um, to what it is now. The prevailing theory of medicine was based on uh, the works of a Greek philosopher called Galen. Um, and he had it that um, the body was made up of four humors and in order to be healthy, you needed to balance these four humors in your body. Um, and you did that uh, through managing your diet, through managing your exercise, through managing the amount of time you slept, how much you um, passed wind, uh, used the <laughs> toilet, all of these things. All of these, um, and that's where you see sort of treatments like bleeding that you might be familiar from, from period dramas, um, the sort of uh, medical intervention to sort of uh, get, uh, uh, help the body get rid of these excess humors that were causing in health, uh, ill health. Now, uh, in order to practice medicine uh, in early modern England, uh, you were meant to be part of sort of three different groups. So you could be a physician, um, part of the College of Physicians, and these were the people who could prescribe, who could uh, give medicines, you could be an apothecary, who were the people that were supposed to make the medicines. They weren't supposed to actually prescribe, but they did in practice. And then there were the barber surgeons who cut your hair or could uh, remove your teeth or set your bones. Um, and so to be part of any of these organizations, you had to be a man. Um, now, in reality, um, the people who, who were providing most um, of the medical care were, was your mom, your grandma, your sister, um, so that there was this inherited knowledge of um, health and medicine and reci medical recipes handed down uh, through generations by women, and women um, held most of this knowledge of caring. Um, and then that, even though technically it was only the men who were supposed to be practicing medicine professionally, uh, there were women who practiced medicine illegally, there were women who sold medicines, women who made medicines, women who nursed. So um, I think generally we can say that sort of knowledge of the human body and health was in a way more holistic. Um, your environment was your health. Um, and. I think we can definitely say that um, people had greater knowledge of how to treat their own bodies. Um, people usually um, went to themselves or their family members as sort of sources of medical knowledge um, in the 17th century. It sounds like modern day social media wellness <laughs> practitioners. <laughs> We're getting back to that now. Um, and you write that the women, um, especially during the plague, the nurses who were doing all this work inside people's houses, so not just ministering to the people in their own families, but going mm. into other people's homes. They were women on the edge. Mm. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so um, these were women. So what I mean by a plague nurse is a woman who is um, contacted by the parish 
to go into a quarantined house to provide care for the people there suffering from plague. Um, and these usually are women who are marginalized in some way. So they are from a lower socioeconomic background or they um, are widows. They're women who are heads of their own household. Um, so part of what I looked at in um, my research was um, a group of women from the parish of St. Margaret's Westminster, which is that little parish church just outside of um, Westminster Abbey, um, which is a beautiful sort of little 16th century church. Um, and the women who nursed in uh, St. Margaret's during 1665 um, were very unusually for the time named in the records. So rather than uh, in other parishes, they might say, oh, we sent a nurse down to Joe Smith's house, or you might say, uh, we sent a nurse down to Popping Alley. Um, this would say, we paid uh, Mary Vincent for nursing. Um, and that was a, a really useful resource because um, it was the only place these women were being named that I found. Um, and by uh, cross-referencing it to um, a, a source called the Hearth Tax, which was a tax levied uh, in England in 1666, um, which basically said the number of hearths or fireplaces you have in your house, you need to pay us a certain amount of money. Um, basically was able to show me what type of, of socioeconomic background these women had. Mm -hmm. So um, overwhelmingly, the women who nursed were poor. They were from households that only had one hearth or two hearths. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I found uh, more than 300 women were named in these records, um, and only about... Um, a third of them were paid for nursing more than once over the course of about a year. Um, and overwhelmingly, those women were from households um, that only had one hearth, or um, they were from uh, nursing done by widows. And what kind of households were they going into? So I think, so the thing is, <laughs> at St. Margaret's, we have the name of the, of the nurses. Um, but we don't have the name of where they were going. Right. So I had to look at other parishes to sort of infer this information. So I looked at another parish, which is the, Saint, the parish of St. Brides in Fleet Street, which would have been just outside sort of the western wall of the city of London, which was um, a poorer parish than St. Margaret's, um, and found that, and in those records it says, we sent a nurse to Popping Alley, or we sent a nurse to um, Dean's Yard. Um, and overwhelmingly, I found that they were being sent to poorer homes. Mm -hmm. So this, um, the system of plague nursing in 1665 was um, overwhelmingly a system where the people who were poor were being sent um, to houses, the houses of people who were poor and being paid for that. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of public health, um, it is a success because people are um, receiving competent medical care. Mm -hmm. Um, and being paid for that. But at the same time, a lot of your chapter looks at public attitudes and private attitudes and how they differ so much about yeah. these nurses because they're quite disparaged in public. I think this is where your work starts to overlap mm. is that our ideas about the plague nurses are actually not quite matching with reality. Yeah, so my first introduction to sort of my um, research area was uh, a novel written in the 1940s called uh, Forever Amber which I do recommend. Um, and, but in Forever Amber, it was made into a film in the 40s as well. Um, there's these really vivid scenes of these nurses being sent into, the, into Amber's house when, when she's gotten plague. Um, and these nurses just keep trying to murder her and her lover um, in, in like increasingly comical ways. Um, I don't think it's meant to be funny, but it is a little bit. Um, because they're so useless and they're just sitting in, they sit in the kitchen and they eat all day and then they're creeping up to like murder them. Anyways, <laughs> so I, when I started my research, I sort of had this uh, image embedded in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, in this literature, uh, which is mostly written by male physicians, people who were the ones supposed to be practicing medicine, mm -hmm. they call uh, all sorts of horrible things uh, uh, an 
unwholesome, ugly hag, uh, abandoned miscreants, the off-scourings of the city. Um, and it's interesting you say that in the 1860s, your women were called whores because um, one word that was used again and again of my plague nurses was that they were strange women. Mm -hmm. um, and since I did the writing and have done the research, I, re I realized that a strange woman was um, a euphemism for a woman who engaged in sex work. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a moral accusation that's being made against these women. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Because the nurses were so um, associated with the practice of quarantine, which was really controversial um, then as now, <laughs> um, I think they, become the person they became the personification of this really unpopular measure. Um, and so um, the worst thing about quarantine was that this strange woman who you didn't know was going to come into your house and she might murder you, she might just be useless, she might steal your things um, while you're incapacitated. Um, so I think the reality that I found was so markedly different from that. Um, I saw women who, there was a woman called Marjorie Stephanie who was paid in July of 1665 an extra um, amount of money for her quote, extraordinary pains in taking care of the sick. Um, that's quite big. Mm. Um, I think that shows these women are doing something meaningful. Mm. Um, and I didn't find a single account of a woman murdering someone. <laughs> um, however, I did find some accounts of poor women um, having to, uh, being involved in burglaries of houses where people had recently died. Um, and I think that's because um, there were fewer economic opportunities. So these women, out of desperation, uh, were resorting to burglary. But yeah, they weren't nurses. Right. Um, so there's also a conflation of all of these poor women are morally bankrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might get one in your house, and she might murder you. So yeah. <laughs> And Kavita, so just coming back to your work then, you also describe at the beginning when these women doctors are first uh, getting qualified, trying to get jobs and finding it quite difficult because people don't trust them to do yes. the work that men, male doctors are doing. Yes. Uh, in fact, one of them, Rukma Bai, whom I mentioned earlier, she uh, decided that she would first operate on a sheep just to demonstrate to everybody that she could operate. <laughs> and then, you know, she could get more people. Mm -hmm. But yes, they were, people were very reluctant to come to them. They were mostly, you know, many of them were sort of shoved into uh, childbirth. You know, they were just, you know, told to you know, help deliver children and look after women who are going to give birth. And they found it hard to uh, work in other fields. So it was very difficult for them uh, to kind of build their practices. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's also important to remember how much social circumstances have changed over the last 100, 150 years. In the 19th century, I mean, it is shocking still for us to hear how common it was for girls to be married and boys to be married very young. Child brides were, were normal. Um, and it was only in the 1890s, as you write, that the age of consent for girls was raised to 12. And, you know, before you think this is just an Indian thing, even in the US, there, were, there was huge opposition to raising the age of consent above seven in some parts yes. of the country at the end of the uh, 19th century. So can you explain these stories? Because many of the women in your book were child brides. Yes. And there's a sort of a change from the beginning of the book to the end, where you can see how India is changing because the first few doctors were all child brides. And back then, uh, it was common for girls to be married at about eight or nine, because it was considered that if you know, a Hindu woman was unmarried at 12, it would bring bad luck to the family. So nearly all these women, the early women doctors, were married off at age eight or nine. And it affected their lives in different ways. The first one, Anandi Bai, who was on the cover, uh, she was the first woman doctor, uh, you know, to actually get a Western education. She went all the way to uh, the Women's University in Philadelphia, Women's Medical College rather, which is now called Drexel University. And she had been married off very young, at about eight or nine. And her husband was a very odd beast. Uh, he was an abuser, but he used to beat her uh, for uh, studying. 
uh, sorry, not study, mm -hmm. for cooking. He used to beat her because she was not paying enough attention to her studies because he was very keen that she become the first woman doctor, okay? So he was a force behind her. So it was a very strange relationship. And it was really because of his, you know, pushing and also some help from, you know, uh, missionaries overseas that she ended up in Philadelphia where she studied medicine. Uh, unfortunately, she died very young before she could actually practice. So her marriage was of that kind. The second woman doctor, the third woman doctor, Rukmabai, she was also had a child marriage, but she went to court to divorce her husband because she did not want to be married. She wrote two letters to the Times of India under a pseudonym called a Hindu lady, in which she describes how terrible child marriage is for Hindu women because you are barred from getting an education, you become a domestic slave. And this moved people so much that there was a huge liberal outcry, both in India and in England. One of her supporters actually was Rudyard Kipling, okay? Uh, and she wrote letters to Queen Victoria. The outcome of all this was that she eventually was able to divorce her husband, but with a lot of difficulty. And uh, the next woman, Dr. Hema Bhati Sen, she was a child widow. She was married at age nine. Her father was actually very encouraging of her studies, but he couldn't really combat the huge social pressure to marry her off. She was married at age nine to a 40-year-old man. She was widowed very early, and she wrote this most scathing diary, okay, which nobody read about, in, which was translated from Bengali only recently, in which she completely flays the entire Hindu system. And she says, in no other religion do you condemn nine-year-olds to be married to 40-year-olds and then live their lives as child widows. Mm -hmm. And she became a doctor not out of any sort of, you know, high moral compunction, but simply because she wanted her child to feed herself. And uh, so child marriage really affected them. And then towards the, the end, sorry if I gone on too long because it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Towards the end, the later women doctors, they do not marry so early. Yeah. They do get married, but later, and to men who are more or less on the same level and more men who are more or less on their equals. But even they, even you know, one of them, Dr. Mutulakshmi Reddy, she says, if I were to advise women doctors, it would be to not get married yeah. because it's <laughs> just a... You know, a royal pain in every way. So, you know, not in those words, but okay. good advice. Even, even um, so, I mean, as you've explained, um, the education of these women, the the stories that you're describing, is happening against a social backdrop in India in which there are campaigns for nationalisation, uh, for nationalism. There's also these huge social reform movements in which there are so many people trying to, in their own vision, modernize India, turn it into a kind of different place. And the women are part of that project as well as uh, pursuing their own independent sure. careers and wanting to become doctors themselves. So when you were writing that story, was it a surprise to you to what degree these women are not only striving to become doctors but also becoming part of those social movements? Yeah, this is such a good question. Because the first doctor, Anandibai, she was a Brahmin. And in those days, if you crossed the ocean, if you crossed the Kalapani, the black water, you would lose your caste. Okay, now, so, now we just laugh at that. Yeah. So, just to, so Brahmin is the highest caste. And yes. In fact, in some ways, women of those higher castes are subject to even tighter... Yes, rules. it's very complicated. Yeah. They have some freedoms and then they don't have some freedoms. Mm -hmm. So Anandibai actually went before the town community and she said... I want to go abroad to do what has never been done by a woman before. May I please go? And only when they said yes did she go, okay? And she followed all the rules. In fact, my, my chapter on Andibai is titled The Good Wife, you know, after the TV show, because she was exactly like Alicia Florek. She did everything by the rules. She dressed like she's supposed to do. She did not eat beef. She stayed married to her husband. Uh, and uh, then, you know, uh, later things sort of changed with Rukmabai, who, as I said, broke all the rules. And you are right, because uh, when Rukmabai came along, Hindu society just sort of rose up against her. If there are any Indians in the audience, you will be familiar with uh, Bal Gangadhar Tilak. He is one of our most sort of revered freedom fighters who fought 
you know, against the British, went to jail, and he was a great man. However, in the realm of women's education, he was not, you know, uh, he was completely against scientific education for women, so he completely attacked Rukmabai. And when I talk about this in India, people are like really shocked because we were all brought up sort of venerating Tilak. You know, he had this special slogan, he came up with the slogan, Swaraj, independence is my birthright and I shall have it. And he went to jail for years. But he was completely against Rukmabai sort of upsetting the apple cart divorcing her husband, doing things that Hindu women are not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. So they had to contend. It was not as just so simple for them as just you know going to university, doing well, and coming back. They had to contend with so many social factors. And the next woman, Hema Bhati, she actually won a gold medal. It was taken away from her and given to a man because you know, you, God forbid a woman get a gold medal, the men will all rise up and protest. So it was taken away from her and given to a man, and she was given some money. So yes, so they had to contend with so many factors, really. Yeah, and it, it is heartbreaking to read about these women who are doing so well academically. Yes. And even though people accept that they can do well academically, they don't want them to because it would damage the egos and the self sense of self of the boys in the class. Yeah, and if <laughs> they just, don't want them to Sorry if I'm interrupting and going on too long, but this was mirrored in the UK because the Edinburgh Seven, they were a group of seven women in Edinburgh who studied in the 1860s and they got their medical degrees in 2019 when they were mm -hmm. dead. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Because they were not given medical degrees back then because they were so good, they won so many medals that they just decided to stop their education, take away their medals and, you know, just evict them, so. Yeah, it's heartbreaking to, I mean, to read these stories. Um, but also, I mean, the thing about reading and writing about gender and history is that it does poke holes sometimes in our dearest heroes. And Florence Nightingale is one. Can you just very quickly, Lara, explain yeah. that as much as we all also revere Florence Nightingale, she was against women doctors. Yeah, absolutely. So um, part of what was challenging for me in approaching my plague nurses was the idea that uh, Florence Nightingale helped propagate was that um, nursing didn't become a proper medical profession and nurses didn't provide medical care until uh, she and, and her sort of ladies of the lamp um, which wasn't true. Which, <laughs> it, yeah, which wasn't true. Um, I, I feel really strongly that my nurses um, definitely provided um, medical care, and that they weren't just there to watch or they weren't just there to sort of feed. Um, but, yeah, she was quite... <sighs> Florence Nightingale, if you, if you read anything she's written, she, she was a, a bit of a character... I, I think in the room before, now I called her venomous. Um, <laughs> but yeah, she, she was really resistant. She, she sort of had this idea that women could make wonderful nurses, but she was very hesitant to give any sort, of, lend any sort of credence to the idea that women could be any, anything more than that. So um, yes, she was wonderful. Yes, she did great things, but um, she, uh, as so often happens, um, women can can be actively involved in in their own um, subjugation. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember. I mean, this comes up so much politically these days. Is that we want to see history in these very black and white terms, and it's never that way. People are always more complicated than that, and that be is because they live in a different time, and they're ex you know, they're experiencing different ideas, different social mores. And Kavita, just coming back to you, then. Um, I mean, one of the other interesting things here is that you would expect that the women who are becoming doctors in India in this early time are being inspired by the women around them, encouraged by the women around them. But very often, as you write, it's their fathers that are driving it. And in, in some cases, the women in their own families, the mothers and the aunts, are actively discouraging them, yes. holding them back and ex uh, forcing them to maintain traditional roles and the fathers of the progressives. Can you explain that what might seem like a paradox? Why? Yes, uh, and yeah, that is surprising in a way, but in another way not so surprising because, yes, you're right, many of the women doctors were very much encouraged by their fathers to study, uh, to avoid child marriage, to do things that you know other women had not done before. 
And quite often it was their mothers, their aunts who wanted to, so them to get married and you know, not study so much. I think this is because the mothers and the aunts, they knew the price that women paid for straying beyond the accepted lines. And it was not an easy price to pay for most women. Yeah, uh, you know, it was not easy for Rukmabai to be attacked by the whole of India. It was not easy for, you know, Hemabati Sen to, uh, to be a doctor in rural West Bengal. She was sexually harassed, she was jeered at. And it's, it must have seemed much safer for them to, you know, just stay in the house, do what we have done. Life will be easier for you. That's my understanding of, you know, and we don't know why they did that because the writings do not survive. That's my understanding of this sort of conundrum. Um, yeah. What do you think was driving the fathers to hold these much more progressive positions and pushing their daughters to be educated and to work? Uh, well, in the last one, a very interesting woman who is called Dr. Mary uh, Poonan Lukos, she was actually in the state of Kerala, uh, which is one of the most advanced states in India even now. She set up the entire medical system for Kerala. She was a woman far ahead of her time in terms of vaccination, in terms of so many things. <laughs> She belonged to the Syrian Christian community, which is also a, quite a privileged community. And her father was a royal physician to the uh, queen and the kings and queens of Travancore. So he told her, I mean, his writing survived. He said, you have a social obligation to help those who are less fortunate than you. And that sort of stayed with her. Okay, and he, he really encouraged her and he said, you need to do things that other women do not do because you are very privileged. So I think some sort of social uh, conscience, really. And also at the time, tales of the women in the UK and the US who had become women doctors were trickling to India. Mm. And some men were thinking, well, maybe my doctor could be that. My daughter or my could be that, or my wife could be that. Mm. And as I say in this book, it's not as easy because even if you are a reformer, outside, when you come home, you want your cup of tea and your dinner on the table. And that is what many of the men found, you know, they found that they could not be as reformist as they wished to be. Yeah. So, and that's a story you see right across the board globally, yes. Yes. is that, you know, as much as people ideologically might want reform around gender in practical terms, they're not always so comfortable with it. Um, and one of the other uh, lenses we have to remember at this time is race. And these women, of course, as you just said, are traveling to other parts of the world. What was their experience there? You, you do write about Mutu Lakshmi Reddy, who even after graduating the top of her class in medical school, this was in 1912, was looked down upon by European doctors and nurses in India when she went back to work. Yes. Uh, a lot of them, even though they studied in the UK, when they went back, they were secondary to European doctors. Uh, and then some of them also had the double sword, Mutlakshmi, of also being looked upon by looked down upon by Indian doctors because they were like, you don't know our ways, you have just you know come back from London and so on. I think the person who had it very difficult was again the first one who's on the cover, Anandi Bai, because when she went to Philadelphia, she was a Hindu, she was a practicing Hindu, and there was a huge amount of pressure on her to convert. And she was only able to go to Philadelphia because of the missionaries who helped her. So she had this sort of tightrope that she had to walk along. She had to please them, but she had to please the Hindu conservatives back home. And her letters in Marathi do survive. And she is so open about the Orientalism that she faces. She's like, oh God, you know, another American lecturing me about, you know, my Hindu ways, my heathen ways. <laughs> and she's like, I don't want to hear this anymore. It's very tedious, you know. And there was a lot of Orientalism that she faced because she was referred to so many times as that little brown woman, that little brown baby, and that heathen who's come here and who needs to be taught our civilizing ways. And she found that very difficult, but she was never allowed to talk about it. So she wrote in letters to her husband, you know, she wrote about the frustrations that she faced and how she was treated. Uh, but to the end, she wore her sari uh, and she ate her diet. And in a way that some people say that may have contributed to her death because it was freezing in Philadelphia and here she was in a sari, okay? 
she refused to wear to change her clothes or her dress at all so it's it's such a complicated rope you know tight rope that they had to walk and now we don't even think about it i mean we just cross the oceans we put on our coats we eat whatever we want yeah. because they showed the way so yeah <laughs> yeah and it wasn't that long ago it wasn't that, that long ago long. actually yeah um, so we're going to take questions in about eight minutes, but first I just want to zoom forward to the present because we do, things are so different now. Um, I studied engineering and it's still, demographically engineering is still very much skewed male. Medicine really isn't. I mean, you go to medical schools now, it's often majority women who are studying medicine. These, these are not easy degrees to do. Obviously, they've proven, them, women have proven themselves. Um, Lara, do you think that it was women like the plague nurses and others who kind of set the stage for giving women access to these particular areas of academia, even if they weren't allowed in others? Yeah, I, I do. I think the fact that um, caring and medical caring was unofficially so um, embedded in a woman's sort of tasks and responsibilities meant that when it became, when it came to sort of um, them formally training, it was a little less controversial and it happened a little bit earlier than um, in fields like engineering. So I, I do think it's because um, there was less of sort of a, uh, a cultural shift to make there. Yeah, and, and Kavita, do you feel the same? Because in India now, obviously we have so many women doctors, it, it's not at all surprising or weird to see women doctors working in hospitals and surgeries. Yeah, so India is quite different from the UK in that nearly everybody, man or woman, immediately becomes an engineer. You become an engineer first, and then you decide what you want to do later. Okay, first, first you become an engineer, okay? Uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating too much when I say this, but uh, there are a lot of Indian women in medicine the problem that I have found and uh, is that, you know, the stats show, I don't have the latest stats, show that so many of them, after a few years, just drop out of medicine right. or engineering or any other STEM field. There are so many women in STEM mm -hmm. because STEM is highly encouraged in India. And the reason they drop out is, you know, complicated, but mostly it's because of household responsibilities, children, in-laws, parents, difficulty in traveling to work, all that kind of thing. And this is exactly what I said. I mean, you know, you can be a revolutionary in the streets, but, and you know, uh, something completely different between the sheets. It's different, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very easy to be a reformer, but you know, when you come back home, it's not that much has changed, yeah, really. The dishes are still in the yeah. sink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and also, I did want to ask you about what it's like to write about this topic in India right now at a time of particular nationalist fervor when Modi has, without a doubt, the prime minister has taken the country in a certain direction and there is a tendency to want to paint India in only a rosy light, and you really don't. I mean, you talk about you know, child widows, child brides, about the son preferences of that time, all these customs that people, that were so damaging to women's lives over the 19th and early 20th century. Is that difficult for you? Uh, not really. I haven't had much pushback over that. A lot of young women doctors, in fact, in my family, my family is almost entirely doctors, and <laughs> they have all said to me that we didn't realize it was so difficult. Because we, for us, it's so much easier. And we didn't realize it was so difficult back then. Uh, and I haven't had much pushback over that. But you're right in a way that India is a very, very young country. Most of us are below 25. Mm -hmm. And there is this sort of wave that we only show the positive sides of ourselves to the West. And there's a lot that is positive. but. Sometimes that demographic dividend can turn into a demographic curse, as you know. Uh, and I think there is some sort of subtle pressure to always talk about Indian success stories without realizing how we have got to where we are. Mm -hmm. And despite being the fifth largest you know, economy in the world, we have overtaken the UK. 
there is still a huge amount of poverty, a huge amount of inequality, and that is where we have failed completely. I, I do strongly believe that the gap between rich and poor is only increasing, and that is a terrible thing that we should be ashamed of in a way. Yeah, so. I mean, it's difficult for all nations and states to own up to their difficult histories. Um, I, I, I mean, a completely different question, Lara. When we were going through the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm sorry, this is going to feel completely tangential to what we've just been talking about, but it's impossible to read your work on the Great Plague and not think about the COVID-19 pandemic and what that was like. What were you thinking when we were going through the pandemic? Yeah, it was a it was a really interesting experience for me as a as a as a historian of epidemic disease um, to sort of see the similarities um, from the fact that uh, in this in the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries in Italy they practice a very very rigorous uh, form of quarantine versus the sort of more lax version of quarantine um, that was practiced in England. Um, through to um, what I thought about quite a lot actually was um, the diary of Samuel Pepys, who was um, uh, he worked for the English Navy in the 1660s, and he has a really interesting time during 1665. He spends a lot of time going out, partying, having having fun, and then um, he'll talk about, oh, I went out, I went down to so and so's house, and we. We drank, and I saw his wife, and he probably sexually harassed his wife. And then um, he'll say, and then on the way home, uh, I saw I saw quarantined houses, and I got really stressed out. So I I, I smoked some tobacco and and had a um, took a preservative, and and please God um, uh, defend me from the disease. And so there's sort of this dichotomy there between his experience, where his life is going on as normal. But then he has these sort of like sudden stark reminders of what's happening all around him, um, and that <coughs> tallied really well with my experience. And and in a way, what it feels like to be sort of alive now, like you 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 live your life and every day, and then suddenly you'll remember something horrible that's happening all around you. Um, I think another thing I thought about quite a lot was obviously my my plague nurses in the literature were were quite. Um, heavily defamed, and I, in during the pandemic in twenty twenty, of course there was clap for the NHS and everything like that. But um, my husband is um, he's a neonatal registrar, so he didn't work directly with COVID. But um, the way that uh, I think, and I won't speak for every doctor, but the way I think that the medical profession feels a bit unappreciated mm -hmm. um, is has come really strongly to me. Um, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, sounds fascinating. Thank you. Mm. So we're going to take questions now. Please raise your hands. We also have questions online. So I'll take one in the audience and one online and keep going until we run out of time. We've got one over here. We'll go here first. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you very much, all three of you. That was really fascinating. My question is for Lara specifically about the plague nurses. You mentioned that they were sort of like paid for and sent by the parish. Was this a role that women, did they volunteer for it or did the parish just go sort of you, you and you, you're nursing now? So, so I think it went one of two ways. So I sort of said that there were sort of these 300 named women um, and of them, I think one third um, did nursing more than once, and of uh, and of the three hundred, I think it was something like less than one in ten nursed more than four times. So I think if you were in particular need, in such need that you would need to go to the parish for relief for money, um, you would be picked on. Yes, yes, Mary, Mary Butler, uh, you can. Um, you can have this money, but I will send you to a quarantine house. And I say the name Mary Butler because Mary Butler uh, was a nurse eight times during the pandemic um, and very fortunately survived. Um, but I also think the women who were a nurse once, which is a majority of them, I think those, and this is pure speculation, I think that might have been a case where my neighbor has plague and I know her very well. So I'll go and I'll go take care of her family and I'll also be paid by the parish. I, I choose to believe that that sort of generosity and charity happened. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
We'll take one online now. Um, yes, yeah, so a question from our online audience says, <coughs> in the 17th century, the circulation of blood was discovered. How much influence did this have on the nursing by women, or did it create a more elitist form of medical care? Oh, God, mm. I really thought we wouldn't have a blood question. <laughs> 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 I'd avoided that. Go so, um, the, the good news is I don't think it changed that much, because actually ideas of what caused plague and how you could cure plague remained really consistent over the 16th and 17th centuries. So the idea was that um, plague was um, a poison in the air that you would breathe in or that you took in through the pores of your body and it would basically cause um, your, it would cause your blood to become poisonous. But the way that you removed the poison from your blood wasn't bleeding or anything like that. It was um, uh, to take medicines that would cause you to sweat. Um, so you would uh, administer these medicines, people would sweat, and they would wrap you in all these blankets and place the hot, heated stones all around your body, um, and they would do this for hours and hours and hours. Now, that was probably um, misadvised. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think the way you cure plague is with an antibiotic, but um, they did also administer, I, I make fun of them, but I do also, they also administered medicines that would have um, treated a number of the, um, the symptoms. So they would have relieved pain. They would have relieved headaches. They would have um, soothed any of sort of the, the buboes or um, carbuncles that formed. Um, but yeah, <laughs> a circulation of the blood didn't actually change that much, surprisingly. Um, and that could be because a lot of the written plague literature was simply reprinted every time there was a new epidemic. Right. But yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, any more questions here? There's one down here. Yeah, you've been talking about uh, the, the great plagues in the 19th century. Uh, sorry, in 1665. What happened, has, do we have any, know anything about what happened in the, in the Black Death in the 14th century? Um, so I don't know that n uh, nearly as well. I think... Um, the, the distinct difference would have been um, that in the 17th century, um, it was post-Reformation. Um, so that's where you see um, sort of the, the innovation of this parish model, where the parish will pay money uh, for the relief of people who then provide care for other people in the parish who are suffering from plague. <laughs> Um, before that, a lot of medical care, if you needed somebody outside of the family, would have come um, from a religious community, um, like um, the local house of nuns, for example. Okay, wonderful. One more online. So we have quite a long one here um, from somebody called Sun. Um, so they ask, were you aware that Maharaja Ranjit Singh's granddaughter, Princess Bamba Duleep Singh, went to the United States for medical school? Um, where she completed three years of schooling with distinction until the school administration decided that women could no longer study due to their gender. This influenced Bamba's sister, Princess Sophia Duleep Singh, to become a suffragette during the UK suffragette movement. Why don't we know this story, given that it's royalty and also part of British history too? Ooh, so I hold my hand up to that. I didn't know about this. <laughs> uh, so I have been reading about Sophia Singh and Bamba Singh, uh, more about Sophia, uh, but for some reason I did not know about her sister. Uh, I'm thinking she might have gone to the same university, so that is definitely a hole in my book. Uh, maybe if I do you know, another edition, I might do an update. I didn't really come across this anywhere. Uh, that's a good question, yeah. But it is quite common in, your, in the stories that you have here to have women go, going to university or be accepted and then the university itself changing its mind halfway yeah. through or towards the end yeah. when they realise how well they're doing. I mean, I say that in my foreword. I say that the research on all this is just so patchy and full of gaps and there are so many women I didn't cover who uh, you know, actually did go to these universities, graduate and practice but I could not find more than three or four lines about them. Uh, so I didn't cover them. And I do get a lot of people saying, but why didn't you cover this woman? And why didn't you cover that woman? And I admit that the book is not exhaustive. It's, 
is just what I could find, really. <laughs> yeah. okay, wonderful. I think there was a question here. Oh, yes. Um, with regard to the plague nurses, was that for every parish in England had to provide plague nurses? And how was it funded? Was it funded through the parish or the, or the state in some form insist upon it? Yeah, so um, it was um, it was in 1578 that the Elizabethan plague orders were issued, which sort of set up this system of quarantine. So it would have been every parish in England. Now, most parishes in England would not have been affected by plague in the same way that a very urban area like London was. Um, another thing I'll note is that sort of the practice of quarantine and putting these nurses into homes and putting, you know, the padlock on the door and putting someone outside the house to guard it, that was done really patchily and really sporadically until um, the plague year of 1636 um, when uh, the city of London instituted its first plague tax, um, which then funded the padlocks and the people to watch the house and the money for the nurses. So, yeah, it's then that you begin to see uh, this practice being, um, we speculate based on the fact that padlocks were being purchased, um, being actually practiced, and also um, that's when you begin to see more of this literature being produced about how bad quarantine was and how wicked these nurses were. Um, so a question from Dr. Sarah Dabbs. Um, they ask, um, is there any evidence that women tried to protect themselves from contracting the plague? And did they believe that they could catch the plague by touching the patients? Um, so one of the limitations of the sources is that you don't get the same sort of anecdotal stories um, from women practitioners like you do from male practitioners. So I'm thinking about like, uh, really famous uh, memoirs of the plague written by physicians like Nathaniel Hodges, who wrote a book called Loima Logia, um, where he talked about every morning he would he would take this electuary medicine and then he would he would um, uh, go out to the houses and have these herbs burned in the brazier and he would put a little um, a little you know medicine on his mouth to dissolve while he treated patients and then every evening he went home and drank a cup of sack wine. Um, and the two times he thought he would get plague, he just simply had a little bit more sack wine. Um, <laughs> and that's true. Um, but um, you don't get the, um, it, the, that from the stories in the same way. And I think the, um, the access these women would have had to those types of medicines would have been much restricted. Um, but food was considered medicine. So I think they would have been having the type of food that was commonly recommended, which would be in the morning, take a piece of toast with butter and a bit of garlic. Garlic was seen as sort of anti-poison. Mm -hmm. um, and they wouldn't have thought that they could get plagued by touching. They would have thought it would have been by breathing. So it could be they also carried a little pomander around with lavender or orange peel, a nice smelling thing so that they could sort of hold it to their mouth. Sorry. Isn't it, it is remarkable how much in recent years we have moved. It's not that we've abandoned uh, formal medicine, but people are moving towards food as medicine, these ideas. My doctor recently just recommended acupuncture and meditation as a way of reducing blood pressure or anxiety. And, you know, we, we hear about these other holistic remedies mm. and doctors are recommending them. Do you think we're changing now the way that we think about health? I think, I think a, to a certain extent, I think the reason why the the sort of medical theories of Galen were so prominent for so long is because they sort of made sense. Like, they tallied with how we think about the world. Like, when you smell something really bad, your immediate instinct is to get away from that thing. Um, and it would make sense to sort of think, maybe that's making me sick. So I think the idea that, uh, like, I do think it makes, it sort of... Uh, works with how people view their bodies. And that's why there's such an inclination to sort of go towards that and sort of maybe distrust uh, the professionals a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I also think people want to have, they want to believe they have the knowledge, right? Um, and increasingly there's, there's a distrust of authority. Yes. Um, but yeah. That's true, that's the whole 
extra and all that we could be having. I'll just tag that on, yeah. Okay, I think there's one up there. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to point to this lady here at yeah, the back, actually. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, with the exclusion of women from the medical field, uh, this has had an impact on women's health today. Do you, um, but I wondered if there was anything female plague nurses or the first Indian doctors did that change women's health that we still do today? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm. Should I answer? Yeah. 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 So uh, one of the doctors in this book, the one I mentioned, Dr. Mary Poonan Lokos, she was an early pioneer of vaccination, uh, smallpox vaccination. She was also an early pioneer of modern medicine at a time when Ayurveda, which is like an Indian system of medicine, uh, not peer reviewed, okay? <laughs> uh, okay, and uh, so she was very much for modern medicine. I mean, I, you know, in India we have two divisions. We have homeopathy and we have allopathy. For me, it's medicine and not medicine, okay? Uh, she was a very early supporter of vaccination, modern medicine, hygiene, all these things, which made a great difference in Kerala, okay? So several of them did uh, champion very unpopular ideas at the time. And I remember Dr. Mary was said, well, why do we need to have universal vaccination? And I was working on this at the time that the pandemic was on. Why do we need to have universal vaccination? And her words just sort of echoed to me over the years. And she replies and she says, it's an airborne disease. Mm -hmm. And therefore we need to have universal vaccination. Otherwise you're going to have whole villages coming down with you know, pandemics. And she was so ahead of her time. So yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not in any formal way that, as a historian, I'd be able to cite or track. But the knowledge that uh, women had as caregivers through history, I think, has has contributed. Um, that's from the the types of herbs um, and spices that you might use in a medical recipe, which had really efficacious effects on um, certain. Uh, symptoms um, down through to sort of, um, yeah, just in, in general practice, what, what would have been good for, for specific illnesses, good for specific medicines. I think that all started somewhere, and I think it often did happen with these women. Yeah, I, I do think we forget that throughout history, we've been, we've been hearing this idea that women have been excluded completely from medicine. But if you think of medicine or the health as a much broader Informally, thing, yeah. then of course women have always been involved right yeah. from the beginning. Um, yeah, that's always been there. Should we take an online question? So Jagdish asks, did midwifery retain female dominance or did men try to muscle in? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did? Uh, midwifery. Uh, oh, oh, well. They were mostly women, as far as my research shows. Uh, and I think it's women were sort of pushed into that because one of the women, Hemabati, complains that all I get to do is to deliver babies and the men, and I don't get paid very much, and all the men uh, keep all the more prestigious, you know, uh, specializations. So I think men did not take over as far as I can see. It's women who did all, you know, uh, childbirth, anything to do with childbirth. Yeah. In, in the 17th century, there was a, a process of medicalization of childbirth, I think, at least in, um, in Western Europe. Um, one of my plague nurses actually was a midwife. So I think uh, all for, for your normal day-to-day -day person, it would have been a woman who was experienced, who had attended several births, who had had children herself, she would have been delivering your child. Um, but certainly at sort of the highest tiers of um, socioeconomic wealth and power, I think increasingly physicians were beginning to say, this is our remit. Um, and you see that in the, the births of uh, Louis XIV's children in France, for example. Yeah, and, I, and it does come through in both your work, this kind of fear around privacy. <laughs> being a big concern for women not wanting to see male doctors sometimes. Was it in your book, Kavita, that I read about a woman who had a string attached? Yes, yes. And the only way a doctor could know, could examine her was by pulling on the string. 
Yes. She was in a different room. It was just, yes. <laughs> how would you know? Yes, that? because so many women were in Parda at that time. And that actually encouraged, you know, the development of women doctors because uh, people were like, we cannot, I cannot possibly allow my wife to see a male doctor, so let's have more women doctors. So that actually led to the development of more, you know, encouragement of more women doctors. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, one more question from the audience. Oh, we have so many. Is it over there? Or was it you? Sorry, go ahead. Um, f following on from the midwifery question, um, is there any detail you've come across around women's role in abortion or contraception in the research? I don't think so. Uh, but the records are just so patchy. I mean, I'm sure there must have been many abortions, but nothing stands out for me. Yeah. Um, sorry, I've just thought. Um, so as part of my research, I looked at um, these recipe collections, which would have been essentially these big books of, sometimes it was a mixture of sort of um, culinary recipes and also medical recipes um, that would have been handed down generation to generation. Now, the examples we have are mostly from elite women or uh, women from the gentry, um, but they would have been handed down generation to generation, and you might get several different handwritings in there indicating there are several authors, and you might get notes in the margin about whether it worked or not. Um, sometimes these, these do include um, recipes to bring on bleeding if you're expecting... Um, your your menstrual period and it hasn't happened yet, um, you might <coughs> induce bleeding. Now, um, so like a euphemism. A euphemism, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. So e there were yeah herbal remedies used for that, and they were passed down between women. Yeah. It's interesting because this issue of reproduction and abortion. I mean, we think of it much more formally now. Of course, there have been informal practices across all communities all over the world, but. In the formalization of it, it coincided with the eugenics movement. So many of our great female feminist pioneers of um, contraception and abortion were actually also eugenicists. And for them, it, it held yes. a social question as well as a medical yes. one. Um, OK, one more question. OK, there. Um, Angela, in your introduction, you started off by saying that, well, you started to say women now dominate in medicine, and you stopped yourself and con corrected it to kind of go back to the numbers. Yeah. So a lot of the themes I think that are coming out today from the speakers are things that women in medicine still experience. Yeah. Um, and certainly that kind of status within certain branches of medicine, so you know, orthopedic surgery is a classic, yeah. where women have fewer exposures to complex cases, we still have a significant gender pay gap in medicine. Yeah. So bearing in mind that we have the numbers, we have this long history we're building on. Mm. At what point do we actually get the equality? Mm. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm, there was, when, when, I, when, I, when I was thinking about um, this question and how women practitioners were, are treated now, um, and if there is any sort, sort of equality, like I said, my, um, my partner is a neonatal registrar. He works almost entirely with women. Mm -hmm. But um, he and I have had a lot of conversations about this because just last autumn, there was a report written called um, oh, Breaking the Silence, which is about uh, widespread sexism and sexual harassment in surgery. And it's not a report I would read if um, yes. your well-being might be affected by... Um, stories about that because it is sobering reading so even though you're right because the the barriers that women face the the misconduct they might face at work um, the barriers they face to working when um, whilst yes we have one we're so blessed to have access to maternity pay I'm from America maternity pay is not the same in America as it is here and it could be better um, what what happens career-wise with men who don't need to take career breaks for versus women who do, um, the, the sacrifices I've had to make to my career so that I can make my caring situation work, um, something, and it can't be um, sector-focused fo so either. I think we need to have a really strong look at um, the way uh, we support women and the way we support people generally. To, to excel in any workspace. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you do, I mean, the misogyny that is so clear in the literature in the 19th century around even the idea of a woman practicing medicine, I think, in not just in medicine but in other fields, has just got pushed to smaller and smaller areas. So like you say, surgery now mm -hmm. is the focus where women still get treated as though they're not capable of doing this anymore. It's going to become harder and harder to make that case over time. Obviously, just like it was, it has become impossible now to make the case that women can't be doctors, full stop. So I would hope things improve that way. Kavita, what do you think? Um, I can't speak to the UK, but I can say that in India, I mean, this is an anecdote I tell sometimes. My husband's in the audience, and uh, his mother, uh, so his grandmother, did not get an education. She was married off at 12. Uh, by the time you know of his his mother's time, she got some education. So she was educated till about 17, but she could not do a degree. Mm -hmm. His sister is a doctor. Uh, she has got several impressive degrees. So in two generations, you have gone from being virtually illiterate, where she you know his grandmother could only read in Bengali or not even very much in that. And his sister is now a doctor in rural West Bengal, not in a posh city making a lot of money. Okay, in rural West Bengal, helping people who really need it. So there has been progress, a lot of progress. Okay, but I mean, there's just so much more that needs to be done, really. But you can still see dramatic change in India because, you know, there is just so much sort of from one generation to the next. And his sister has been supported in every way by his parents. Like they've literally put their entire lives on hold to support his sister in her career and to help his sister in their career. And this is happening in India as well. It's not just the bad news. So, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So should we take one online? Um, so for Dr. Lara Thorpe, um, someone else asks, would um, plague nurses also have to attend to other domestic activities too? Uh, yes, I think the idea was that your plague nurse would sort of oversee the house's activities, might do some cleaning, might do some washing, um, but also because of the way, because diet and food were seen as medicine, I think that the, the um, plague nurse be preparing uh, nutritious meals that were efficacious against plague, I think there was an expectation. And I think that did happen. Although um, the, the historical record is quite scant on what happened when a nurse actually entered a house. However, there was... Um, Difference, a difference in payments for a woman who's paid for nursing versus a woman who is paid for watching or a woman who is paid to do the washing. Um, so the, the roles were seen as different, but yes, I think the nursing role would have still involved um, creating a healthful environment for people to recover. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Can we have a big round of applause? For